I'm sitting uh, on a folding chair in the middle of the New Mexico desert. It's about a half hour before dawn, and with me are a bunch of other people who have come to a place called the Bosques del Apache. It's a bird sanctuary. We're sitting there waiting in the cold. I'm not a big time naturalist, but my wife is an avid birder. And I, I say to her, teeth chattering while sipping coffee from the thermos, for this one, honey, I want extra points. And we sit there and watch, and gradually the horizon turns into a thin ribbon of, of orange, and then bright orange, and then the whole sky explodes. And dawn comes with such amazing beauty and power, it's staggering. And together we all watch as within the next 15 minutes, 25,000 snow geese, herons, great blue herons, God knows what else, awake from their sleeping on the waters of the bosques and fly off into the dawn's early light. There are so many of them, and they are flying all together and all at once with such intensity that I can literally feel the flapping wing-flung wind on my face. The park rangers the night before had warned us. It's called the flyaway, and they say, you are never the same after the flyaway. And now I understand. Simply being present for such an event changes your perception of what it means to be a creature. And here's the thing that startles and amazes and chastens and humbles me. The birds do this all the time, whether I'm there to watch them or not. They wake up to the dawn's early light and fly off into the sunrise, a sky full of beaks and feathers and wings flying off, just like the great whales do it through the oceans just like the mitochondria do it through the protoplasm in our cells. Great streaming currents of protoplasm, flying, streaming, praying, swaying, doing what they were meant to do, doing the only thing they know how to do. While I, obsessed with some writing assignment I'm working on, am doing, I guess, what I'm meant to do. My God, as I think about it now, I can still feel the flapping wing-flung wind on my face. Let me try to explain this amazing experience by telling you a story about my learning how to play the clarinet. About seven years ago when I turned 55, my wife, as a surprise, presented me with an R13 Buffet B-flat clarinet. This is the Cadillac of clarinets. Now, this would only normally be the story of another extravagant and beautiful birthday present were it not for one other surprising thing. Prior to that moment, seven years ago, I had never touched a clarinet in my life or read a note of music. Ha, 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 how did you know, I said to my wife. She said, well, we've just been listening, and it turns out that you've been mumbling about it for 20 years. I checked with the kids. They heard it, too. Well, so I've been taking lessons now, learning how to play the clarinet for the past several years. I'm still disappointed that I haven't had any feelers yet for major symphony orchestras, but it's becoming increasingly clear that reading music is going to take a lot longer. And not only is reading music difficult, but then there's keeping time. To help you keep time, they divide the music up into little vertical bar lines. So I count. One, two, three, four, end of measure. One, two, three, four, end of measure. One, two, three, four. My tutor turns to me and says, how come you're pausing at the end of every bar line? And I say, because there's this little measure line here, this little bar line there. She says, you're not supposed to play that. I say, I'm not playing it. She says, well, yes, you are. You're pausing at the end of every one. I said, well, how would anybody know it's the end of a measure? She sets down her clarinet and turns to face me in exasperation. And she says, let me put it this way, Larry. The bar lines are not there. 
I know it looks like they're there, but the bar lines are not really there. We just add them to help you play the music better. This reminded me of something I learned from my friend and colleague, Professor Daniel Matt, who's now translating the Zohar, the great mystical text of Judaism. Danny Matt taught me that we have words for all the parts of a tree. We have words for leaf, twig, and branch, but we must not get so carried away into thinking that because we have words for all the parts of a tree, that a tree really has all those parts. A leaf doesn't know when it stops becoming a leaf and has become a twig. The twig doesn't know it's no longer a twig and has become a branch. The branch doesn't know it's stopped being a branch and is now the trunk. Trunk doesn't know it became the roots. The roots don't know they became the soil. The soil, don't, the soil doesn't know it's become the moisture or the sunshine. All of our words are arbitrarily superimposed on what is otherwise seamless reality. In other words, we have to take reality and divide it up into component parts to manipulate it so that we can imagine we know what's going on, but in truth we don't. The Kabbalists, the great Jewish mystics of old, explained it this way. They said that there are two worlds. There is a world of separation, where everything is divided, where everything has a beginning and an end and a definition and boundaries and coordinates, and if it's a human being, has its own agenda. And then there is the world of unity, where there are no parts, where there are no beginnings, where there are no ends. And indeed, the Kabbalist said, the way we can explain this, the only way we can explain such an all-embracing unity is to call it nothing, or nothingness, or in the words of the Kabbalists, the Ein Sof. And so what they did was, is that they said that there is a world of separation that we all live in now, with all its discrete parts and elements. But that world of separation resides within the bosom of the world of unity, where there are no parts. And in moments of heightened spiritual awareness, in moments like I experienced when I saw the flyaway in the New Mexico desert, for a few moments I had slipped into the world of unity, where there were no parts, where I was one with the birds and with all the creatures and with all of being, and I understood the meaning of the unity. Perhaps the simplest and best available metaphor for this holy nothingness or this world of unity we're talking about would be to say in the words of the theologian Richard Rubenstein that God is the ocean and we are the waves. Many people think that because they are present within the, the ocean that they understand who they are. But the truth of the matter is, is that it can be divided up in several different ways. The ocean itself represents all of God. And when people think that they are something, then they think they are in control of their lives and they have all the pieces and all the separate parts. But what they really need to understand is that when they slip into the ocean, when they become one with the nothing, then indeed they are really something. You might say that they are like a drop of water that you and I are like drops of water fallen into the great ocean where it's no longer possible to know where the beginning or the end is. We are one with God and one with the ocean.